While Cardano had lots going on with its own affairs today, we got quite a nice reminder that crypto does not exist in a vacuum, and the specter of a Chinese real estate collapse still looms over the global economy, including all of crypto and Cardano. Ready? Let's go. Once again, we've got a lot to cover today. We're going to talk about the Evergrande roller coaster we experienced today. It turns out that, like a lot of things in authoritarian states, you can never quite tell what's going on with gigantic real estate development companies that may or may not be defaulting on the grace period for their bond obligations. We're also going to talk about the Catalyst Natives program, the IOHK blog entry on network optimization, kind of long awaited in, in, in some ways. Um, I was super happy to see it. And a small, but I think kind of exciting revelation as to us possibly getting both the PAB and the ERC-20 converter in the next couple of weeks. Well, 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 we were on quite the little carnival ride today. We had some people claiming we were experiencing the initial throes of Lehman 2.0, a CCP Lehman, and other people saying it was nothing. And it seems like it's possible they're both right on different timescales. As near as I can tell, this all started with this group, DMSA, DMSA, Deutsche Mark Screening Agentur. You can tell I don't speak any German at all. <laughs> But this company, however you pronounce its name in German, everybody's calling it DMSA, lets us know they are an independent data service that collects and evaluates market-relevant information on companies, products, and services. I know what you're thinking right now. You're thinking, hey, what was all that talk about them acting like they're one of the creditors of Evergrande and they could somehow initiate bankruptcy proceedings? Turns out the DMSA answered that exact question in this press release they put out. And the press release does not mince words. Again, this is one of those things where I'm reporting what someone else has put out into the, into the internet sphere. I'm not presenting anything I'm about to read as truth. This is just what's being uh, pushed out there by DMSA, or at least by this website that appears to be DMSA. So... They straight up say Evergrande officially defaulted. DMSA is preparing bankruptcy proceedings against Evergrande Group. I know you're thinking, hey, you just said they're a data service. Why are they the ones preparing bankruptcy proceedings against Evergrande Group? So they let us know DMSA itself is invested in these bonds and has not received any interest payments until today's end of the grace period. Now DMSA is preparing bankruptcy proceedings against Evergrande and call, calls on all bond investors to join it. In order to be able to file for bankruptcy against the company as a creditor, DMSA itself invested in Evergrande bonds, whose grace period expired today, November 10th, 2021. In total, Evergrande would have had to pay $148.13 million. You saw these headlines today all over Twitter. But so far, we have not received any interest on our bonds, explains Metzler. Metzler is a DMSA senior analyst, we learned up here. He adds, with banks in Hong Kong closing today, it's certain that these bonds have defaulted. I don't know the details of this. Obviously, I wasn't in the position of DMSA or any of the other uh, bond investors who might have been receiving payments today. But I kind of wonder, I kind of wonder if timing is an issue here. He says it's certain that these bonds have defaulted with banks in Hong Kong closing today. It's certain these bonds have defaulted. I kind of wonder about uh, sort of the contractual definitions of the bond defaulting. If let's say Evergrande initiated a payment, they somehow initiated a payment, but it hadn't quite reached reached Dr. Marco Metzler here and his colleagues at DMSA. I, I don't know how the uh, I don't know how the obligations are actually written in these bonds, but I kind of wonder if it's a situation where initiation of the payment was enough to qualify as a payment, but by the time that this document was written by DMSA, they hadn't quite received the payment yet. So I think there's some some legal fine print here in these bonds that we're not really privy to. 
But of course, Twitter went crazy with posters like this, Morning Brew saying, Breaking Evergrande, the second largest real estate developer in China, has officially defaulted on its bonds. When I would Google Evergrande today, the first news article that showed up under the News tab on Google News was actually this article, which went as far as to say, China's Evergrande Group officially defaults. And then the first sentence was China Evergrande Group officially announced that it had defaulted on Wednesday. They're saying that China Evergrande Group themselves officially announced it. Simultaneously, we saw headlines in mainstream publications like the New York Times here saying China Evergrande meets another interest payment deadline. So we have two narratives being painted in direct conflict with each other. One saying that uh, DMSA hadn't been paid and that they were an investor in the bonds. And the New York Times here saying China Evergrande meets another interest payment deadline. But then when you come down and read the first paragraph of the New York Times story, you see China Evergrande, the troubled property giant, made interest payments on at least two of its bonds on Wednesday, a company bondholder said, a sign that it yet again managed to head off the default. Of course, a lot of people knew that interest payments were due on at least three bonds from Evergrande, Evergrande today. This led to chaos with half the people saying Evergrande had defaulted, the other half of the people saying that those people were idiots and it hadn't defaulted, and it was very unclear for quite a, quite a period of time. Later on in the day, however, we started seeing reporting on some Bloomberg information. So Bloomberg, here is showing up in Yahoo Finance under this headline, but they're, uh, they're reporting Bloomberg information here. They say, customers of international clearing firm Clearstream received overdue interest payments on three U.S. dollar bonds issued by Evergrande, a spokesperson for Clearstream said. So this is the clearinghouse saying, actually, they did, they did make payments on all three of the U.S. dollar bonds. It says investors have been waiting to see if the embattled developer would make the coupon payments totaling 148.1 million before the end of the 30 day grace period on Wednesday. This is what we're left with sort of at the end of the day. And even the New York Times article that was updated at, I think, 4, 458 Eastern Standard Time, so the end of the day on the East Coast in North America, started reflecting this Bloomberg information. But both things can't simultaneously be true. DMSA is saying, hey, uh, we're an investor in those bonds. We didn't get paid. And Bloomberg is saying, hey, the clearinghouse is saying, and in fact, the way I found out about it was like the New York Times was reporting that Bloomberg was reporting that the clearinghouse spokesperson was saying the payments were made. So we don't actually have like any direct information from any of the uh, bondholders that they actually got paid, but we do have this chain of reporting from a spokesperson at the clearinghouse, uh, Clearview is the name yet? No, Clearstream. A spokesperson at the clearinghouse, Clearstream, saying that the payments were made. So things are pretty, pretty blurry, pretty blurry at this point. And I think the consensus has definitely shifted toward we don't have a default, but you know, it's like a lot of things with any authoritarian state. You never quite, there's always this like lag period where you can't quite, you can't quite parse the truth. You don't quite know what's going on, which is pretty convenient for the people who actually do know what's going on because they can start making moves if it's something that's going to be momentous. We like to think that, that our markets are efficient enough that they would reflect this kind of information quickly, but we did see pretty big movements. If you're watching the uh, crypto markets today, you did see pretty big movements in the crypto markets. And you don't know if that was based on a false narrative that Evergrande did in fact default on at least some of their bond interest payments today, which uh, we've seen people saying would result in a cross default of all of their bonds, or if that was misinformation from DMSA, Maybe it was due to some kind of a settlement time issue. You know, maybe the clearinghouse clear, I keep forgetting the name, Clearstream here. Maybe Clearstream could already see that the payments have been made, but maybe DMSA couldn't quite, it hadn't been quite reflected on their books yet because of some kind of a settlement lag. We don't really know. So things are a little uncertain. But what we do know is that 
these kinds of issues, which don't directly have anything to do with crypto, you can argue there's kind of a there's kind of a little side story here about whether or not Tether has exposure to the Chinese bond market. But there's no direct connection here. And even so, this Evergrande news had more of an impact on the market today than anything going on in crypto. I know the people who think crypto lives inside the vacuum, they're gonna make all kinds of they're going to create all kinds of narratives about how no, this was actually something that was going on in some some futures market, completely unconnected to anything going on with Evergrande. But it seemed to me like we simultaneously got this Evergrande scare or default, whatever it was, and we did see an impact in the crypto markets. I think it's just a good reminder that no matter how well things are going in crypto or badly, big global economic events like this can overwhelm anything we've got going on in crypto. And we did in fact have a lot of things going on in crypto and in Cardano specifically like this. IOHK rolled out the Cardano or the Catalyst Natives program. They let us know the purpose of the Catalyst Natives program is to enable any organization the ability to leverage the power of the crowd to solve business problems and outsource solutions. And this was kind of announced in this article, but it was also a big piece of the Catalyst Town Hall today. So in the Catalyst Town Hall, we had the COO of Koti come on and talk about how the first Catalyst Natives pilot project was going to be one funded by Koti, Koti as part of Ada Pay. It'll be called the Ada Pay Challenge, I believe. This is gonna be a $100,000 challenge to create an Ada Pay plugin so that small and medium-sized enterprises can easily and seamlessly accept payments on their websites with a simple plugin. So I think this is kind of interesting. This is an expansion of the Catalyst program. And the success of Catalyst, it makes sense that we start expanding it to, um, to other businesses so that other businesses can come in and fund challenges and uh, people in the Cardano ecosystem can, uh, can answer, answer those challenges and even find a little bit of funding in this case. IOHK also dropped a new blog entry called Optimizing Cardano. And this is the whole network optimization discussion. Obviously, people, I think, people are projecting that there's going to be uh, quite an onslaught of usage. <laughs> and I, I use that term onslaught to make it sound to make it sound violent and abrupt. <laughs> but with the Plutus application backend coming online, you know, literally all of the dApps that have wanted to come online, except for the very, very few that have decided to launch prior to the PAB launch, all of them have been waiting for this PAB. And the second the PAB comes online, we'll have not only this large amount of NFT traffic we've been experiencing lately, but also all the PAB traffic. And this is one of those times, it looks like this, uh, this article came from Tim Harrison. And I really appreciate exactly what we talked about yesterday in yesterday's video, the intellectual honesty here. Tim Harrison was given not an easy job in this article to tell the, to tell the truth, to be intellectually honest about what's going on. And it's not a bad thing to say to people, hey, I know you all want easy answers, but the truth is exactly what he wrote. This is a gradual, this is a process of gradual step-by-step -step adjustments. There's no magic bullet that helps a blockchain scale. I mean, guys, we're the first big EUTXO blockchain and we're in the top 10. We've got smart contracts, we're proof of stake, we've got Gen 3. Nobody's really done this before. Nobody's done this before at this level. And it is going to take step-by-step -step adjustments and nobody knows of a magic bullet that's going to fix anything. So he, he discusses the congestion issue. And to be fair, congestion is an issue for every single blockchain that's doing a lot of volume. Nobody's really figured that out. And when I say can figured it out, I mean figured it out within the confines of also legitimately trying to solve the blockchain trilemma. He reminds us something that I think people neglect, and that's that there are really two pieces to this. We've got not just throughput, which is a piece that everybody talks about, but we've also got timeliness. If you just have throughput and no timeliness, your blockchain is not going to be great. You really need to have both. He tells us the total budget for block adoption, which is propagation of the block across the network, 95% of the stake, is set to five seconds in Cardano. 
So down here below, he, he goes through, you know, sort of like the various aspects of, of the congestion issues. And then he lets us know, hey, here are the things we're doing. We all know that Hydra is coming. And he doesn't just say, hey, uh, guys, just wait for Hydra. He says, okay, here's what we're actually doing right now. Here's what we're working on. Besides Hydra, we've got block size increase. They can work on the mempool size and they can work on script compression. And he also talks a little bit about EUTXO systems in general and kind of reminds us that there's a learning curve to developing apps on EUTXO systems. And we've seen that there can be very different approaches to dealing with concurrency in EUTXO systems. And inevitably, I think anybody looking at these different approaches can see that there's, there are probably going to be deltas between how efficiently those, those systems work. I mean, they're not all going to have the same results. Uh, there might be some methods of dealing with concurrency that increase congestion, and there may be some methods of dealing with concurrency that decrease congestion. Again, I personally really appreciate the intellectual honesty here. They're not just saying, Hydra, magic bullet, don't talk to us about congestion. Hydra will solve all. Instead, they're saying, hey, we're working on these other things. We're working on block size. We're thinking about the mempool size. We're thinking about script compression. And down here, they say in the midterm, in the midterm, Hydra will bring additional capability. And in the long term, our chief scientist and team are working on other methods and mechanisms around pricing frameworks and enhancing the Ouroboros protocol. So again, what we find with uh, IOHK and Cardano in general is this intellectually honest approach, which allows us as the community to see what's actually happening and not just getting these sort of marketing puff pieces. Uh, I think this is this is obviously an example of uh, IOHK telling us what they're actually doing and what we can realistically expect instead of us getting just some kind of a marketing puff piece. So thank you for the honesty and clarity once again, Tim Harrison. Finally, we got kind of a surprise, but I think highly significant revelation out of Daniel Friedman. I believe he's a longtime IOHK guy, and I think he lives in Japan. He posted, stoked about the ERC-20 converter and PAB, both ERC-20 converter and PAB dropping in the next several weeks. It will serve as a catalyst that will spark a firestorm of brand new and long-awaited DeFi and DAP projects launching on and moving to Cardano. So we already knew about the PAB dropping in the next several weeks. What we didn't know is anything as precise as this about the timing of the ERC-20 converter. So now we get to imagine the long-awaited ERC-20 converter is going to drop in the next several weeks. The PAB is going to drop in the next several weeks. And both of those, you know, I, I think it's, it's fair to say that both of the, either one of those could result in a lot of increased activity on the Cardano chain. We don't exactly know how many Ethereum projects are going to want to migrate their tokens over via the ERC-20 converter, but we know it's pretty attractive just given what the Ethereum gas fees are doing. And we definitely know that a lot of projects are waiting on the Plutus application backend. And it looks like the timing of these two things is going to converge in the next several weeks. So while we don't know what's going to happen with Evergrande, either now or next time interest on their bonds come due, we do know for sure there's going to be interesting things happening in the land of Cardano. Talk to you tomorrow.